tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. A portly haggard clown stood opposite, clutching a pathetic sign from rotting cardboard with crude markers scribbled across the front. His putty-stained gloves and sour facial expression gave the whole thing an even weirder vibe. His frayed white outfit was smeared with red, black, and gray putty, some of it practically dripping off of him as he moved his body at awkward angles to accommodate the feats of the cardboard. What the fuck? Yessie and I exchanged a look of bewilderment at the absolute state of the man some twenty feet away from us in the rapidly dwindling parking lot. It was late. There'd been a phenomenal concert across the street where my ever-daring friend Jesse got a little too rowdy and had his face kicked in. We were absolutely engrossed in his hilarious wincing before the sound filled our ears, and the smell assaulted our nostrils, and our eyes felt like they needed bleaching after reaching the source. Bro, I uh, don't think you mean hungry, Jesse began, still clutching his nose and sounding almost comically congested. I think you meant honk if you're hort- Ow! I punched him hard in the ribs and refused to break eye contact with the meat clown as he gingerly twirled the sign around, the cardboard threatening to shatter like his pathetic frame at any moment. He took a step forward, the tarmac looking like it'd swallow his sad existence whole at any moment, his eyes transfixed on me and Jesse as a soft gurgle began parting his lips and working its way through the air into our ears. Huh. It carried on the wind, but it wasn't strong enough to make out. I thought maybe he was coughing as Jesse continued to bitch and moan. What the hell, Rich? He rubbed his arm dramatically barely paying attention to the meat clown shuffling towards him. But I was. Something about him just fell... off. He started to sway from side to side, and closing that gap slowly but surely. My hair stood on end. Jesse, on the other hand, fueled by adrenaline, walked confidently towards him and held out a hand to his ear. Tell me a joke, Brother Penny, he bellowed, fully expecting laughter to break out at any moment. But it didn't. Ha, <sighs> ha, The sound became clearer. Each consonant gurgled out in a guttural drone, his eyes wide and piercing amid a sea of white makeup and thick black eyeliner. A red sigil painted on both sides of his cheeks and joining down at the chin. He edged closer, gripping the sign tightly, nails digging into the cardboard. One started to peel away as it was forced in further, black, rotting flesh poking out from underneath. You'll have to speak up, my man. I gotta say, so far, your outfit is way funnier than your routine, Jesse bellowed, slapping his thigh dramatically and laughing. But when the clown kept walking close, his laughter petered away very quickly. Before I'd even had a chance to close the gap and pull Jesse away, this macabre mascot was face to face with him. Literally. I immediately walked towards them, sensing danger. But with every step came new clarity on his features, and I am ashamed to say, I slowed down when I heard him properly. Honk, was all he emitted, but it was guttural, low, elongated, like a rumbling in his diaphragm that his throat was barely able to push out beyond a croak, the last gasp of a dying soul, rushing to leave a decaying corpse. His eyes were the sole thing on him that looked alert. The white paint wasn't white paint. It was sallow, malnourished skin stretched to the absolute brink over gaunt cheeks and frail limbs. His outfit's putty was covered in flies and maggots. The stench was enough to make me gag. 
Jesse stood, frozen in horror as the clown pressed his face directly onto his, unblinking as he continued his bizarre and unnerving cry. As I pulled Jesse back by the scruff of his neck, a sickening squelch sound followed by a snap cut the air and stopped the bizarre honk. It was a portion of his nose. The gangrenous flesh was still attached to Jesse as he screamed and pulled at it, desperate to get it off of his face, though the clown seemed completely nonplussed by the issue. He simply bowed, wiped his hand, and held up the sign, walking away from us and towards a small food shack at the far end of the parking lot where the woods began. It had a few benches with some people sitting around it, and black smoke was billowing out of its chimney top, but the inside was a mixture of too far and too dark to make out. Dude, that was the grossest prank ever! This isn't YouTube! Jesse shouted after him, but clearly too frightened to pursue. He finally ripped the flesh off of his nose and stomped on it, calling it shitty putty, as he did. But as we got a little bit further away, the same sound rang out again. A guttural, almost muffled and elongated honk. The noise filled the empty parking lot, and I looked around for its source, unlocking the truck as I did so. Jesse, what the fuck you think he is? I asked, craning my neck as if somehow the weird fucker had grown wings and turned into the ultimate nightmare fuel for any sane person. A flying clown. When I turned to look back, expecting Jesse to be halfway into the car and grabbing the AUX cord so he could blast my ears with code orange, I saw him kneeling on the floor and clutching at his stomach. I'm... I'm so... hungry, he winced, pulling at his stomach and his head shaking profusely. I thought he was having some kind of food poisoning moment and didn't know if I should move him or give him some room for the impending explosion. But before I could even move, I heard that sound again, clearer and more pronounced. Jesse was making it. I looked at him and while still clutching his stomach, his mouth hung open and the noise rang out filling my ears and giving me goosebumps. Not knowing what else to do, I helped him to his feet and started towards the truck. Come on, man, I got food at mine if that's what you need. But I... I really think you should go to a hospital. No! He pushed me away with surprising strength. It took me aback. I stared at him in shock as his face grew wild, instinctual, maddened. I need to eat. That's too far. But there's that place right there. He pointed a shaky finger to the shack that the mascot had wandered off to. That'll do. Not far. Come on. He winced again before setting off. You want to follow what could be the end result of Pennywise fucking a zombie. Dude, he just freaked you out. He freaked me out. Can't we just get food at home? If I'm honest, I was pleading more for me than him. Clowns bothered me at the best of times. But this one, being devoid of joy entirely, set me off all the more. Jesse wasn't having any of it, though. He sauntered off and spoke less and less as we got closer. The shack had a dingy sign written above it, but it must have been in another language or made up of the same symbols in the clown's cheeks because I couldn't make heads or tails of it. It was pretty sizable, and there was no car attached. Instead, it was just placed directly onto the concrete, with huge metal clamps in the corners jutting out. The cook must have been absent as the inside was pitch black, save for some swift movements from something inside. 
The benches had a couple of homeless people sleeping on them, but given the part of the city we live in and the late hour, I sadly wasn't surprised. That rotting stench hit me again as we got closer, and I had to hold back vomit, covering my mouth and my nose with my sleeve. Oh my god, Jesse, can't you smell that? I called, but he was practically rushing to the table and ringing the bell. Oh, come on, man, they're obviously closed. We should... A fucking plate with a stack of discolored meat appeared before my fucking eyes. If there were a pair of hands doing the work, I did not see them. Jesse didn't even wait to pay, just left his wallet on the side and took the food to the nearest bench, gorging himself on the rancid meat and moaning. I tried to get closer, but the smell was overbearing, the assaulting stench of sweetness and putrid meat. Just, um, wait in the truck. I'll be ready as soon as I'm... <clears throat> as soon as I'm... <clears throat> oh, God. Yes. <clears throat> Jesse was drooling between bites, thick globs of saliva as he scarfed the food down, choking before continuing. I was so lightheaded at the time that I didn't think it'd be so bad if I went for a quick drive to clear my head. I nodded and rushed away from the smell as fast as I could, desperate for clear air. Turning on the AC and putting some piano music on, I tilted back the driver's seat and rested my eyes for a few minutes. I could feel my stomach protesting, every growl reminding me that while there was food nearby, I sure as hell wouldn't have it. I grabbed my stomach in protest, but it simply growled more, every twitch like a finger prodding against the flesh. The sound shifted and changed, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. I came to before I'd opened my eyes, and I am so thankful I didn't immediately do so. I could hear the groans, the dripping of the meat, the gaudy, shambolic outfit. He was in the car. The meat clown was in the fucking car, his decaying body leering at me, making that fucking noise. That sounded like a death rattle, the sort of thing you'd hear someone say when it's their final breath before passing on. I heard a sound I couldn't place, like the sound of a wet bag being dragged along the concrete. I looked down and spied a chunk of grey sludge being pulled from his pockets, directed towards my face. I could see it undulating. I wasn't about to let him put that shit on me, so I instinctively leaned my head forward and smacked it into his. I immediately regretted my choice. I missed. A punch to the side of the temple left my ears ringing and my eyes blurred. Adrenaline was the only thing fueling me at this stage. But, as I turned to scream at him to get out, I saw his face. Wide-eyed and with a switchblade to his eyelids, he was rapidly slicing through them with remarkable precision and skill, all the while making that dreadful sound. But it was changing. He hissed as he split one eyelid free, the eye rolling in its socket. He started on the lower one as I stood frozen in fear and horror. In less than thirty seconds, both eyelids were gone, and he cut the soft stalk holding the eye in one slice before cupping it in his hands, still making that sound. He put the hand out toward me as I rapidly scooted away. I could see the eyelids and the eyes were rotted, fetid, and decayed. He persisted, pushing it towards my mouth until I had no room to move. 
My hand reached for the handle and all my weight fell out and back onto the concrete, my skull hitting the concrete with a thud. The next thing I knew, he was holding me down as he forced his hand down on my mouth as it filled with soft meat. He pushed hard on my jaw against my will, and as it burst in my mouth, I felt my vision fade and the world around me shake, his expression never changing as that sound carried me into unconsciousness. The first thing I felt when I awoke was pure disgust. I retched and tried to vomit, but it wouldn't come up. Not even when I put my fingers down my throat, as if there was nothing in my body to regurgitate. Now, I was in the driver's seat, the clock showing it had been three hours since I'd left Jesse. I couldn't taste anything in my mouth, and there seemed to be no damage to the car, so I chalked it up to a horrific nightmare. Concern overtook confusion rapidly, and I got out of the truck to find Jesse. It was still early hours, and the place looked even darker than before, but in the short time it took to reach the food truck, I could see far more people aimlessly wandering around, some on the benches and others congregating. Was there a late night craving or something? Maybe the bars had just let out and they wanted that drunken fast food experience. The rotting stench from earlier was totally gone too. I could smell the succulent aroma of sizzling bacon, tender crispy chicken, a medium rare steak, and flavors that took me straight back to being a kid again. My dad making a barbecue on a summer's eve and playing Nintendo while I happily ate and kicked my feet. God, I wanted that feeling so badly. I couldn't help but feel hungry in that moment. You know, captured by the memory. I was so lost in the moment that I almost missed Jesse. When I snapped out of it, I saw him. All of him. He was still eating his jaw locked and ripping at the hinge, muscles still pumping, and the tongue lazily drooping over the side as gnarled hands shoved more cold meat into his gullet, the throat akin to that of a duck, and just absorbing it into his frame, not even properly chewing. But the eyes were vacant and milky, the nostrils weren't moving, and his stomach was bloated. Whatever was pushing him to continue eating had taken his soul with it. This, this was no longer Jesse. This was something else. Something horrifying. I looked around, wondering why nobody had stopped him or called for help. But when one of the women passed me, I noticed the similarities between her and the meat clown. Sallow skin sunken eyes, gaunt features, all signs of pure malnutrition and a zombified state. What the fuck was I in the middle of? The smell was overwhelming in much the opposite way from earlier, threatening to take me away into another beautiful memory and making my stomach squeeze and groan in protest. But I fought to keep focused. My shock the only thing stopping me from crying at the sight of my dead friend. Something cut the air, though. It ripped through it, and every person surrounding me perked their ears up and snapped their eyes to where Jesse sat. It sounded like someone stamping on a packet of sauce. It was squishy, and followed by a distinct pop and a wet thud. Jesse's stomach had ripped open his entrails scattering on the floor and in his lap. Immediately, the people around rushed to him, knocking me aside as they fought each other to grab the plates, scrape, or, in a truly barbaric fashion, pulling at his entrails and squeezing out pieces of digested meat to savor. I stumbled back until I bumped the counter of the truck, hitting the bell with a horrid, Honk. 
Snapping around, I saw the sign in clear English. Pav loves meat. Just like before, a pair of unseen hands rushed to attention as the smoke billowed, and a smell so overpowering filled my lungs that made me cry. The violence ten feet away, a distant memory. Even the meat clown's distant, horrifying smile wasn't enough to sour my mood or my craving for that memory food again. Nothing was. There was a small package in my hands. I didn't realize I was even holding it, not until I was back in my car. Sunlight will be creeping over the horizon soon, and I've no doubt people will ask where Jesse is, but I doubt they'll ever find him. The package is a small to-go box, wrapped in foil and still hot to the touch, the smell making me smile when it wafts my way, the emotion like looking at a puppy you're taking home after losing your former best friend. The issue I'm faced with now is that in addition to the horrific hunger I can feel building in my stomach, I can look around and see people going about their early morning routine, each one of them with that same sign the meat clown was holding, all of them directed at me. Honk if you're hungry. I can't see the food truck, the people, Jesse, or anything else but the signs and the visions of better days with better food. I can only hear the honking, and I am so, so hungry. You know those people who you tell the time of events to 15 minutes early because you know they'll be late? The people who would be late to their own funerals, as the saying goes. Well, that's me. Prepare as I might, I can never seem to get anywhere on time. It's the most frustrating trade ever, but yet it's absolutely always my fault. It hasn't always been this way. Before I had my daughter Bryn, almost nine months ago, I was one of those people who took punctuality very seriously. The kind of guy who looked at the traffic flow on his phone and made sure to get gas the day before. I even set my oven clock five minutes fast so there would always be a five minute advantage. I was prepared for most obstacles. However, what I couldn't prepare for was the unpredictability of Bryn. Her needs and moods varied like all babies do. There was no rhyme or reason to her play. She did what she wanted when she wanted, no matter if it made sense or not. It was like she was saying, No, Dad, I will lay here and eat my food for exactly 1 minute and 27 seconds. If you attempt to remove it before the time passes, you will be met with total non-cooperation, not to mention the crying and flailing of limbs. We had a good enough routine before her mother left us about three months ago. I'm ashamed to admit I threw away the outfit our daughter was wearing the day she left. Over the preceding week, she had been donating a lot of her things to Goodwill. Supposedly it was to make room for more in our closet. My wife said she was trying to be less materialistic for the new year. It turns out she'd been moving her things to another house. Newfound parenthood hadn't been going well for us. I told her to take a night out with the friends while I spent one-on-one -on -one time with Bryn. When I kissed her goodbye that night, I had no idea she'd never be coming back. Since then, the baby and I have just tried to make the best of our situation and establish new routines for both Bryn and myself. These are the thoughts running through my head as I rushed to Bryn's nine-month doctor checkup. We are early for once, set and out the door. Then, naturally, she pokes the nipple through her bottle and pours it all over herself. 
So we go back to the house, clean her up, and repeat the process. It's 9.19 and her appointment is at 9.30. It will easily take 20 minutes to get there and that's with cooperative traffic. I'm not going to super speed or lane weave just to be on time. We will just have to be a little late. Again, as usual. We're almost there. There are only about five miles left. I start to allow myself to relax my shoulders a little when Bryn starts wailing. Ah, oh, Christ, not again. Not now, I think to myself, figuring she'd poke through her bottle again. You can't take a dirty baby to the doctor ever, but mostly not for a checkup. It just doesn't look right. It isn't right. The pitch and repetition of her screaming is making my head feel like a kettle that's about to boil. Before it reached its crescendo of shrill whistling, I pulled over. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never stopped or would have pulled into the nearest gas station. Anything other than where I choose to stop at. I pull over and get out of the car and open the door of the back seat. There she is, snotty and red-faced. Her blonde curls are sticking to her face with the sweat of frustration. My little sweetheart, she looks just like her mother when she cries. It makes me sad, but I can't think about that now. She knew what she was doing when she left us. No sense in keeping her ghost around, especially in my own head. We pulled over next to a little roadside memorial. A slightly worn but still pretty silver and pink cross is placed there with flowers withered by the hands of time and various other trinkets of memorial. The name on the cross reads Emily Semple. It looks to be a child's. That makes me sadder to think about than when I think about my wife. It's something at least, I thought. A temporary mental vacation into someone else's hell to be able to escape my own. I look her over and thankfully she hasn't spilled her bottle. Maybe we still have a chance of being somewhat on time. I hand her the bottle back, wipe her face and kiss her forehead, thinking of if I show her love it will help calm her down. As if she could read my mind, she threw her bottle and it bounces off my forehead and onto the floor. Great. I haven't realized how much of a shameful mess my car has become. Napkins, empty bottles, condiment wrappers, baby toys, and maybe even a french fry or two litter the seats and floorboards. In an effort to reach the bottle, I knock some things out of my car and onto the roadside. The wind starts to blow some of them into the road. So, not wanting to travel too far away from the car, I grab what I can and stuff the items back into the back seat on the floor to be cleaned or forgotten about at a later date. We make it to the doctor's office a whopping 20 minutes late. I sheepishly grin and apologize, hoping they can still see her, and I don't have to make another appointment to come back. The front desk lady's voices were understanding, but their eyes certainly had not been. Perhaps they softened when they saw me juggling the baby car seat with a very loud pink diaper bag falling over my shoulder repeatedly as I tried to continue to calm her down. Yes, she was still wailing away. A nurse with a worn face but kind eyes comes over to us. Now, now, little baby. What seems to be the matter? That face is too beautiful to be scrunched up screaming like that. Are you hungry? Do you want daddy to rock you? She turns a gaze to me with a smile. Why don't you take her out, daddy, and bounce her in your arms a bit? Some babies just hate to be in their car seats any longer than they have to be. I smile, thank her, and take her advice. Just as I get her out and sit down with her, the door opens. Michael Hollander and baby Bryn, we are ready to see you now. Come back to room four with the white and yellow clouds. I gather up all of our things and head back to the room. Bryn finally settles down and snuggles into my shoulder. Her thumb's in her mouth, so I knew all was well in Brynville. That's one of her happy places. Taking the thumb train to Brynville, her mom used to say. Two vaccinations and a few spoons of ice cream later, we pull back in the driveway, ready to recover from the whole ordeal. 
As I pulled her out of the car seat, I noticed a little pink elephant with a yellow star on its side. I pick it up and hand it to her as I take her in the house. She coos appreciatively and she grabs onto it. Hmm, I don't remember buying this for her. It probably came from her grandmother's house. She always dotes on her. Every time she's out and sees something babyish, she always gets it for her. It was just too cute and Mimi couldn't leave it there when Bryn would love it so much, she says. Rena, or Mimi as she proclaims herself, is Bryn's maternal grandmother. Since my wife left us, she's gone above and beyond to step up and be there. I think it makes her feel better about the whole situation, as if somehow she feels responsible for her daughter's selfishness and actions. My mother was long gone and Rena is such a beautiful part of Bryn's life. I would never do anything to take that away from either of them. It's hard to find people you trust to help you, and it's become so hard to do on my own. I'm so thankful for every second with my baby, but I definitely wasn't expecting the razor on my own. That was never the plan. My phone rings. Speaking of, it's Rena calling. She had told me to call her after the appointment was over and I had forgotten. I quickly try to think of a somewhat acceptable excuse while I place Bryn in a crib. Coming up with nothing and mentally exhausted, I answer the phone. Hello? Hey, Michael. How did the baby girl's appointment go today? You know how I worry about our princess. She asked me. A couple shots and some tears. Nothing a little ice cream couldn't fix. She's in the 78th percentile for height and 74th for weight. And Doc says it's doing beautifully. I replied proudly. I can hear a subtle sigh of relief from her end of the phone. Good. I'm glad she's doing okay. Do you both have plans for the day? There's a hopeful tone in her voice as she asks this. No, not really. I'm just going to get some cleaning done and maybe head out to the store later to fill up the freezer. She makes a subtle sound of disapproval. Mike, you can't take her out running around all over. She just got shots today and you don't know how she will handle them. Why don't you bring her over here for the day? That way you can do your shopping and clean the house in peace while we have Mimi and Bryn time. After the meltdown and outfit changes earlier, Mimi time does sound like a good idea. I would miss her, but I could get so much more done and maybe even take a nap. She will most likely sleep most of the day anyway, as she always does on shot days. I agree and tell her we'll be over in about half an hour. That gives me time to feed her lunch, pack her back up, and bring her over. I start up the car, turn the radio up a little, and head down the road. It's a beautiful day, and for once, I don't mind driving. It will all be worth it once I come home from Rena's. Besides, I get to spend the drive fantasizing about the forbidden daytime nap I get to take later. I stop at what seems to be the 100th stoplight, even though it was really only the third. Tom Petty's velvet voice comes across the radio, so I reach down to turn up the volume even more. The light turns green and I start to accelerate, humming along and excited to get to her grandmother's house. Suddenly I feel a shock powerful enough to move my whole car. A deafening screech of metal on metal grinds in my ears. It feels as though my teeth are broken and cutting my cheeks from the insides. The car flips once, twice. I feel my head bounce off the steering wheel. All I can think about is my back seat. The car comes to a stop on its hood. My body is burning with white hot pain. Warm thin blood runs into my eyes as I try to survey my surroundings and stay awake. What I initially thought were loose teeth was actually broken glass from my window. It cut the thin tissue of my chapped lips as I spit it through them. I must have gotten hit, possibly T-boned I started to fear. My head swims and my eyes become heavy. The dust inside my car starts to float around me in slow motion, and I feel like a computer shutting down one application at a time. I'm trying to use all of my senses to help me. I hear nothing. There's no crying, no screaming. For the first time ever, I am terrified at the sound of her silence. 
I managed to look back to the one mirror fastened to the back seat that survived the crash. I see my little angel in the back seat upside down, firmly secured in her car seat, motionless. I could fool myself into thinking she's sleeping, if not for her neck bent at an unnatural angle, and the blood that coats her entire car seat. The last thing I see before I lose consciousness is a little red-haired girl standing on the smoking road in front of my windshield. Her face is dirty and caked with dried blood. She's wearing what I guess must have been at one time a white dress with yellow daisies on it. Her broken finger points accusingly at me through the broken windshield. The hatred of her gaze is the last thing my mind registers as I began to fade away. My eyes shoot open with a startled breath as the phone rings. I strangely find myself at home in my chair. A mixture of relief, disbelief, and surrealism washes over me as I take in my current reality. I jolt to a standing position and run to my mirror, examining my head where it hit the steering wheel. There's nothing. No pain. No bruises or cuts. Nothing. Confused but hopeful. I ran to Bryn's room, thankful to see that she's sleeping peacefully in her crib. Either I'm losing my mind, or that was the most realistic dream I have ever had. I rush to her, not even caring if I wake her up. She wakes up and is smiling at me. Her little hands drop something as I lift her up. I look down to see the little pink elephant with the yellow star. I must have fallen asleep after her appointment today. The phone rings again and startles me. My heart springs to life thinking it might be my wife. Maybe her mom is calling to check on her and to say she misses us. My heart springs to life in hopes that she was calling to tell me she had lost her mind and wants to come back. I look at my phone and sadly realize it's Rena. I don't answer and let it go to voicemail. I'm still shaken up from that experience and need to get my shit together. There is no way she won't hear it in my voice and ask questions. I will call her later. My phone then buzzes with a text message. It's Rena, not wanting to take silence for an answer. And it says, Hey Michael, just calling to check on Bryn's doctor appointment today. If you don't have anything going on, please bring her over. I would love to spend the day with her. Talk to you soon. Well, I am definitely not going to be driving anywhere after what happened earlier. It will be a miracle if I don't see that image every time I close my eyes for the next five years. I'm not about to turn a foreboding dream into reality. So I decided that Bryn and I will have a much needed lazy day. I turn on some Netflix for me and the kiddo. I pop some popcorn for myself and sit down next to her on the couch. I let her snuggle into me and we settled in like that for a while. Halfway through devouring my popcorn bowl, she starts to eye it. She would look from me to the bowl and then back again. I withdraw it from her reach and tell her no softly. She lets out an irritated grunt and furrows her brow, once again looking towards my bowl. Smiling at her spunk, and at this point just thankful to have her breathing and alive, I let her have a piece. I walk into the bathroom, satisfied that she's at peace in one spot for once. I'm only in there for one minute, two at most. The living room is silent and my sweet Bryn is on the floor, looking under the couch with her butt in the air. I wait back a moment to see what she is doing, figuring she will pull some lost treasure out from there and try to eat it. But to my horror, she doesn't move. My heart drops as the air around me dissipates. I walk over to her as I call out to her. You spilled Dada's popcorn, monkey butt. Did you find something good under there? She doesn't respond, doesn't move, doesn't breathe. My heart drops as I rush to her. I pick her up and roll her over as fast as I can without hurting her. She flops over on her back like a limp doll and her face is blue. 
I look over to the tipped over popcorn bowl, devastated at how stupid I was. I try everything I've ever read about babies and choking. I turned her upside down and hit her back. I try to put my fingers down her throat to remove the obstruction. There is nothing, nothing that I can do. It's just me, her lifeless body, and the pink elephant at her feet. Tears sting my eyes as regret stabs my heart with a barbed blade. I moan and scream in agony as I struggle with my cell phone to call 911. My head spins as I start to lose my breath. I look out of my window and again I see the little girl wearing the dress with daisies, outside and down the street, staring in the direction of my house. Things tilt sideways as the ground rushes up to meet me. I fade away. I wake up again to my phone ringing, and once again I let it go to voicemail. My heart is beating so fast that I can hardly catch my breath. I am very much still in the situation my mind was just put in. No surprise, it's Rena again. Or maybe for the first time. I'm not even sure at this point, honestly. I can't think straight. I have seen things no parent should ever have to see. The baby that I fought through so much heartache to stay strong for is taken from me again and again. Who is that little girl in the dress? Why is this happening to us? Once again, I rush to Bryn's room. I'm all too pleased to see that she's there sleeping, holding the pink elephant in her hand. I take it away and set it off to the side. She wakes up, her sleepy eyes sparkling, and smiles at me. I've been down, reaching out to touch her as she reaches her hand up to me, slowly falling back to sleep. I let the hell we've been stuck in this week to melt away, soaking up her smile. Whatever is going on, whatever hell I was stuck in right now, we were here. Right now, we are very much alive and okay. Today, we won't do anything. There will be no car trips, no popcorn, no toys in their crib, and no anything that could hurt my little girl. It's my only job in life to protect her, and I'll die trying. The same text message appears from Rena as before, and I decide to call her back. I try to sound as calm as I can mentioned in the same details about the doctor's appointment. This time, however, I declined the offer to come over, decide not to tell her about the horrifying events of the day. If I doubt my own sanity at this point, why shouldn't she? After catching up for a bit, we arrange for me to drop Bren off the next Sunday and she asks, What is Mimi's baby girl doing right now? I reply, She's asleep in her bed holding on to that elephant. Hey, you have no idea how much she loves that. Where'd you find it? There's a pause. Michael, I never gave her any elephant toy. I would have remembered. I make an excuse about Bryn waking up and hang up the phone, feeling dazed. I go to my sweet Bryn. I've decided that I will take her into my room and put her in bed with me all day when nothing can hurt us. We just have to make it through the day and this nightmare will be over. I approach my baby's crib and she is still there. Only now she lays silent, not moving, not breathing. The silken skin on her arms is cold to the touch. Not again. Not again. Although at this point I've seen this far too many times than I'm comfortable with, the fear is always embedded in the back of my mind that this may be the last time. Maybe this time I'll pass out and wake up and my little girl will still be gone. I frantically look around the room for something to hit myself with. Anything to make me pass out so we can begin this again. So I can have my Bryn again. I lost her mother, which still haunts me to this day. I cannot and will not lose her too. Where she goes, I go. She's my only light left in this world. It turns out I don't have to find anything. I feel my breath slow and the room tilt. The little girl in the dress's angry eyes follow me all the way to the floor. 
The more I see her, the more translucent and decomposed her form appears. My worst fear is that by the time there's nothing left, Bryn's chances will run out. I can't let that happen. The phone rings. I wake up and ignore the call. You know the drill. I run to my daughter and wake her up as gently as I can. Only one thing matters today. The only thing that can fix this. We unintentionally disturbed Emily's resting place. The only chance that we have is to return this to where it came from. I stumble my way to the car with her and hastily strap her into her car seat. We take off in the direction of her doctor's office. I just pray I can get there in time with no red lights and no accidents. I see the pink and silver cross and immediately pull over. The contents of my stomach emptying themselves down the side of my car as I rush out of it. I open the back door and grab the elephant from Bryn's little hands. Her eyes go big and her lips puff out with the thread of oncoming tears. That doesn't matter now though, I have what I need. As it leaves her hands it starts raining. I look to the sky, torrents of droplets stabbing at my eyes and scream out. I'm sorry Emily, we didn't mean to steal it from you, please leave my baby alone. I never meant to take it. She deserves to live. There are tears falling from my eyes and spit is flying from my lips. Please. With my free hand raised in surrender, I gently place the elephant next to the cross and back away. It may just be my head, but I swear the air feels lighter, giving me the refreshment of promise. I hope to God that I did the right thing. Bryn and I just need to make it through one whole day. Sleep isn't kind to me as the show 1000 Ways to Die plays continuously throughout my mind like a movie screen. Only my daughter's the only cast member and star in role. Each and every time. A couple of years go by with Bryn growing into a healthy toddler with little to no signs of danger. Her hair is turned into an amber color over the changing seasons. It pains me more and more to see her grow into a physical carbon copy of her mother, but I'm ever so thankful to have each and every day with her. The events of the last few years have taught me never to take her for granted. Every stumble, laugh, toy and smile is a natural gift from God. Her words are coming more often and with less time in between. However, I've been having the hardest time getting her to say her name. She mumbles something each time that I do, and whatever the word is sounds nothing like my daughter's name. The worst thing is, the word that she's saying sounds an awful lot like the name. Emily. Trust me, Cameron said, smiling at his wife, Diana. She looked back at him, no less worried, but he continued to lead her to the basement door. Diana hit the brakes and shook her head, her fingers slipping out of his. Cameron sighed. He looked at his wife with tenderness in his soft features. If we don't have trust now, how are we supposed to have it later? He said, smiling again. This is going to work. I know it in my heart. Diana had tears in her eyes and a pink flush to her pale cheeks. She looked at him until she couldn't, and she looked away. It pained his heart to see her struggling like this, but he understood it. Your heart is full of beautiful, naive, unconditional love, Cam. It's your brain I worry about. This plan feels completely crazy to me. It's reckless and dangerous and not worth the possible consequences. Cameron turned her, making her look at him with those beautiful blue eyes. It is worth it, he told her. It is absolutely worth it, because it proves that the disease is controllable. I believe love will prevail, and I need you to believe in me. Diana sighed, 
She turned away once more and walked across the room to the window, staring out at the setting sun and the fire red it turned the sky. This isn't a game, Cam. It's life or death. I cannot be so lax with this. Cameron still had an endearing look gleaming in his eye when he followed her to where she stood. Of course, I know that, Diana. I think it will take something this extreme, something this powerful to prove the point. I wouldn't have suggested it if I didn't think it would work. Diana glanced over at him quickly, then returned her eyes to the window. What about what I think? Cameron frowned now. He put his calloused hands on her slender arms and rubbed them gently as he leaned over to lightly kiss her shoulder blade. You know that your opinion matters to me more than anything, he said quietly into her ear. But I also know that you are afraid. It's with good reason. But I don't want that beer to sway you. We've been together for a decade and a half. We've had something special since that day we met in the food court of the mall as teenagers. Something terrible happened, and it has made things complicated for us now. But I believe we can make it through this like we've made it through everything else. I need you to believe it too. When she turned around to face him, those blue eyes glistened with tears. And what if I don't? What if I believe the disease is more powerful than us, than love? What then, Cam? Cam reached up and touched her face, the side of his finger grazing her rosy cheek. He smiled once again. Then I will prove you wrong. You just have to let me. I don't like it. I just don't. I'm so scared. If it goes wrong, it won't. Diana sighed. She took his face in both hands and kissed him, sucking gently on his top lip and then breaking away. Then she put her head down and moved past him. Cameron watched her walk to the kitchen. His finger traced where her kiss had been on his lip. He wondered if maybe he shouldn't follow her. Maybe he should let her come to this on her own. But he feared that she might actually not get there, and this was time-sensitive. He could hear her in the other room fixing herself a drink. He heard her shuffling loudly through the ice cubes and then clinking them into a glass. He didn't need to see her to know she was going for the gin. It was always the gin when she was stressed like this. Cameron knew and loved all the little details of her. That was exactly why he knew his plan would work. With that in mind, he walked into the kitchen. She was leaning on the island with her elbows, sipping from a glass, a bottle of gin at her side. Cameron grinned when he saw it. I knew it would be the gin, he said. Just like I knew you would wear the yellow dress to your mother's funeral instead of the predetermined black gown because it was her favorite and that's what mattered to you. I knew you wouldn't get those sandals last year, no matter how much you wanted them, because you didn't actually need them, and it felt wrong to buy shoes when you already had plenty. I really did appreciate that you bought those for me. I love them, she said, downing what was in her glass and hurrying to refill it. You also felt guilty, he said, because that's who you are. Remember when I got that new boss at work and he showed me that he was out to get me his first day there? I loved my job and I was so beside myself. What did you do? I told you to transfer, she said, standing up straight. I said I'd move with you to wherever you needed to go because it meant more to see you happy. Cameron nodded. He walked around her and got a wine glass off of the hanging rack. Then he went to select a bottle. He wanted something good for tonight something special. If things did go bad, he may as well have the good stuff and get to experience it. He chose a crisp Pinot Noir and nodded to himself, satisfied with his selection. That choice is what led us here, Diana. Not just to this town, but to this very moment. Diana wiped her eyes and turned her fearful gaze his way. Do you blame yourself? Cameron was using a corkscrew to open the bottle of wine. I suppose a little I do, he said. It's more than that, though, honey. It was love that led us here, and love that will get us through it. That's my point. Diana still looked nervous. She began to chew on her fingernail. We still have a little time, he told her. 
Put that down and have a glass of this with me. This wine is older than we are. It's a very expensive bottle. It was actually held onto by my grandfather and passed down to me. I've been saving it. And you want to drink it now in case there's only one of us left come morning? Diana set her glass down on the island with a sigh. No, honey. I want to drink it with you as a toast to the future. You may actually be insane. It doesn't change that you love me. You're right, and that makes me worry about my own sanity. Cameron chuckled. He turned and selected another glass from the rack. Then he poured the wine into both and picked one up, extending it to her. Diana hesitated a moment, but then she took the glass. I really do love you, she said. I wouldn't be so scared if I didn't. Cameron nodded. I know that. Now, how are we supposed to drink stuff this expensive? Don't we spit it back into the glass and not even swallow it? Diana laughed for the first time in hours. You have to swirl it first and make sure to put a pinky up like this when you drink it, she said demonstrating. You look so sexy when you're being all sophisticated, he said with a wink, and she laughed again, shaking her head. Then he swirled his wine and took a sip. Honestly, maybe it's just me, but it tastes the same as the $30 wine I buy at the grocery store. Diana shook her head. It's you. There's so many layers to it. I taste subtle notes of berry and cocoa, as well as a delicate floral aroma that adds atmosphere to it. It's intricate and complex, yet also simple with a gentle romantic texture to it. Cameron studied his wife for a moment, searching her eyes. Are you being serious? He asked. Diana spit that expensive wine when she burst out laughing. Not at all. I don't have a clue about that stuff. But it sounded good, didn't it? Cameron laughed as well and leaned over to kiss her. Come here, he said, setting his glass down. Diana moved closer, but she kept her glass and gulped at its contents. Cameron held her snugly and nuzzled her neck. She met his embrace with her own, hugging him warmly. They kissed again. I love you, he said. Diana sighed. She laid her head on his shoulder. Okay, she said. Okay? Okay. So we're doing this? If you keep asking, I'm going to think about it more and change my mind, she said with a mischievous smile. Cameron much preferred seeing her like this than seeing her so worried and sad. No matter how things went tonight, this was a small victory in itself. Duly noted, he said, snatching his glass back up and raising it. To love, to the future, and to the cellar. He shouted the last words playfully, downed his wine, and ran towards the basement. All right, slow down, you goober. Diana called out from behind him. Just because I said okay doesn't mean I'm in a rush. Cameron stopped at the basement door and looked over his shoulder at her. Unfortunately... The sky does not feel the same. Time is of the essence, my love. Even faced with death, you're so corny and ridiculous, she said back. Exactly why you love me, Cameron said, opening the basement door. Let's get this party started. He bounded down the steps like an anxious child. He was nervous, and if he was going to be honest with himself, pretty terrified but he believed that this was going to work. He had to. He heard the steps behind him creaking as Diana made her way down. When they got to the bottom, Cameron pulled a string and a single dim light bulb above it came aglow. Diana came up and stood beside him. They faced an enormously thick steel door together. They offered no quips or barbs this time. They just faced the door in silence. Their fingers found each other and to intertwine. They took big, deep breaths together. Then Cameron nodded and stepped forward, opening the metal door. He stepped through the opening and Diana followed him over the threshold. Then he immediately closed the thick steel door and spun a wheel to lock it in place. Diana let out a quiet, nervous gasp and he put a comforting hand on her back. It's going to be okay, he said soothingly. Believe. 
There's no windows down here. I don't like that. We can't see when it's coming, she said, her voice quivering. We don't have to, Cameron told her reassuringly. We'll feel it. Diana's breathing quickened. She started pacing and fidgeting. What if it doesn't work, Cam? What if it goes wrong? What if this ends violently? Oh, God, I'm so scared right now. Cameron nodded. It's okay to be scared, honey. It's scary. We just have to face those fears and come out the other side. We can do this. Together. I know it. I think you might be a toxic optimist, she said, her head moving as her eyes scanned the thick stone walls of the one-time wine cellar that had been converted into a makeshift prison cell. I don't know how you do it. I think this glass is definitely half empty, and it's going to get worse when we start getting thirsty. You should be scared too, Cam. Why aren't you scared? Cameron laughed nervously. <laughs> Whoever said I wasn't scared? Whoever they are, they're a filthy liar. I'm completely terrified. Diana huffed. She ran her fingers through her hair and tugged at it. Then, let's go. Let's go back up. No, Cameron said. I said I was scared. I didn't say I was having second thoughts. Help me with these. He walked over to two thick iron shackles that were hanging from the left wall over a beat-up old mattress. Diana didn't follow him. She resumed chewing on her fingernail. I should have brought the alcohol down here. It won't matter soon enough. Come on, Diana. The moon is rising. I know. This is our last chance to change our minds. To let go of this insane romantic notion of yours. We're not letting go of anything. Chain me up before it's too late. I don't want to. You have to. Why? Because we need to know this thing can be controlled. We need to prove to ourselves that we are stronger than this affliction. This is the only way. Now, come on. Diana sighed, but she walked over. She picked up the heavy chains and clamped the shackles over his wrists, fastening them. Cameron tugged on them to make sure he couldn't get loose. He nodded to her. Then she bent down and did the same with his ankles. This is so crazy she said. Cameron jerked his arms and legs around, fighting his chains until he knew for certain that he was secure. Okay, he said calmly, although his heart was racing. There's no turning back now. Whatever happens, I love you. I love you too, you crazy wild man, Diana said. She leaned forward and kissed him while he stood there, suspended by chains. It won't be long now, Cameron said. We didn't ask for this. It just happened, and we're lucky. The wolf could have killed, but it only bit, and that old Ford pickup sent it running. We were lucky that day, and we'll be lucky again today. Love will prevail. Let me hear you say it. Don't make me be corny, Cam. Not right now. Please. It's not corny. It's the answer. Come on. Look at me right now. I'm shackled to the wall. Just humor me. Say it. Diana huffed. <sighs> Love will prevail. Can you say it like you mean it? You were right. I can feel it. The moon. It's happening. I know. I can feel it too. I love you. Love will prevail. Cameron smiled. There you go. That time had a lot more heart. We're going to make it through this, and then we're going to go upstairs in the morning and we're going to have our coffee, and we're going to know that moving forward, we are more powerful as a couple than this disease is. It will not have control of us. We will have control of it. We will win, Diana. I know it. Please, just stop talking, she told him, her tears returning. We came down here a couple, but soon we will only be one, one person and a monster. A ravenously hungry, violent monster. We have no idea what is going to happen then. I do. No, you don't. You hope you do. But you just don't know. You can't know. This thing is wild and unpredictable. 
It's an animal. A beast. Oh, damn it, this was a terrible idea. It wasn't. You will see. Just wait. I know the little details of you, too. She said as she paced around the room before her chained-up husband. Cameron watched her eyes as they roamed over the walls and door, the ceiling and floor. He knew she wanted a contingency plan in case he was wrong. She was looking for a way out, a way to escape and run, and he didn't blame her. I know you go through toothpaste fast because the first glob you put on washes right off because you always turn the water on full blast by accident. I know you only like chunky peanut butter, unless it's a fluffer nutter sandwich. Then you like creamy. Because no one wants crunchy marshmallows. That's just weird. Diana laughed, sniffled, and wiped at her eyes. I know you have loved all things butterscotch since you were a child but you never get them because you know that the scent of it alone nauseates me, and I love you so much for that. It really is the little things, isn't it? Cameron said, tears welling in his own eyes now. I still eat it when you're not around, but I brush my teeth with two globs of toothpaste before I see you. Diana looked at him. She laughed quietly and he joined her. They both cried and she dropped to her knees. Cameron lunged to reach out for her, but the chains restrained him, pulling him back. I love you, he shouted. Diana didn't answer. Her body went rigid and then relaxed. She spasmed and jerked. Cameron lunged for her again when her bones snapped and she screamed. He knew it was a futile effort, but he couldn't help it. Her head bent back and her jaw snapped and moved, growing before his eyes. Her teeth grew as well rising and jutting out like so many knives. Her adjusting bones tore through her flesh, shredding it and leaving it on the basement floor. Cameron watched in amazement and horror, and the new flesh showed underneath, covered in glistening silver bristles. Her ears pulled their way up to the top of her head and stretched to points. Diana twisted and jerked before her husband's eyes as her body worked furiously to change shape. Cameron grit his own teeth. She looked like she was in absolute agony and he couldn't stand it. This process was awful and tough to stomach. Looking down to see the floor littered with his wife's beautiful skin, all the blood she lost during the transformation, it was horrible. He hated that she had to go through this. He wished it had been him instead. It broke his heart to see her in pain. When it was all over and the process was finally complete, the only thing left of the woman he loved was those sparkling blue eyes. Cameron stared at the monster that stood before him, a hulking beast of a wolf standing on all fours. He hoped with all his heart that he was right and Diana was still on the inside of that monster. He didn't speak, didn't breathe. The creature had taken his wife's place, didn't seem to notice that he was in the room yet. It had just awakened and was still getting its bearings. The wolf sniffed at the air and looked at the walls. It turned its muscled body towards the door. Cameron couldn't help but gasp when the thing leaped and slammed its giant body into the steel door with a loud bang. Cameron closed his eyes and sighed when he saw that the door held and the thing that was once his wife couldn't get free. When his eyes flicked back open, he saw that the wolf had found him. She was standing a few feet away, staring at him. Cameron could feel her hunger. Streams of steaming drool hung from her lupine lips as she snarled, low and deep. Cameron felt more afraid than he ever had in his life, but he still believed in her. He couldn't breathe or even remember how to try. It felt like there was a huge weight on his chest. His heart was pounding like it didn't care to wait for him and was ready to burst out of his chest to flee the scene. The wolf just stared at him. Was it her? Could it really be? Cameron struggled for a breath and he felt the wolf was watching with a strange sense of curiosity. I love you, he said, choking out the words. I know you're hungry, so, so hungry, but you're stronger than that. You can do this. He felt a little bit mad trying to communicate with a wolf, but he had to try. The beast that was Diana stepped forward. Its claws clicked and clacked on the hard stone floor. 
Cameron swallowed a lump in his throat. His instincts were screaming at him to get free, to get out, to run. But he fought against them. He couldn't give in to those urges. If he treated her like a monster, that was what she would be. He needed to face her, to see her as his wife, as frightening of a concept as that was. He shook and trembled as the wolf drew near. The giant animal sniffed the air again and then continued closer and closer still, those crystal blue eyes staring at him so intensely. It was almost painfully hard for Cameron not to look away. Claws scraped stone. You can do this, Cameron said. It's not the same body, but it's still your body. It belongs to you. You are in control. The hulking beast reached him then. It stretched forward and put its snarling face right in his. Cameron shuddered. He looked at those teeth and he didn't need anyone to tell him they could tear him to pieces in seconds with little to no effort. She was close enough now that he could feel the heat of her lupine breath moistening his cheeks. He could taste it and sense the way she ached to taste him. You're in control, he said again, shrinking away from the creature. The wolf just pressed forward, matching him. Its wet nose touched his, and Cameron shook like he was freezing. He looked down at her, at the mere size of her incredible head. He heard the low rumble that came from her. You're in control, he said again quietly. Tears spilled from Cameron's eyes and ran down his cheeks as he waited for the wolf to rip his throat out, to grab it in those powerful jaws and tear it free. I love you, Diane, he said to the monster. No matter what, I'll always love you. The wolf pulled away, leaning its head back. It howled loudly and ferociously, the sound echoing off the chamber walls. Cameron felt in that moment like his wife had been right, that the beast and her were two different beings, like he wasn't going to make it out of there or prove anything to anyone. After the howl, the wolf's big head lowered so that it could stare him in the eye once more over its muzzle of jagged razor teeth. Those bright blue eyes met his, and then the beast pulled away. It turned from him and padded its way across the room where it turned in a slow circle and laid on the floor against the door. Cameron found his breath and went slack, losing his legs. He hung there in those chains, exhausted but satisfied. I knew it he said quietly. I knew it. Cameron didn't know if she would make it the whole night, if she would be able to resist all the way until the sun rose in the morning, but she had shown enough that she would know either way that the beast could be controlled. He slunk down and knelt on the mattress below him, watching the monster by the door that watched him in turn. I trust you, he said to her. The wolf answered by eyeing him with a penetrating gaze, he gave a low snarl that made Cameron jump and tug on his restraints. It was going to be a long night, but it was worth it to Cameron to prove to his wife that she was stronger than her sickness. The night was young, but he believed in her. He believed in love. He believed in tomorrow. He had to. Cameron startled awake, amazed that he had somehow fallen asleep while sharing space with a monster he couldn't run from. That monster is your wife he reminded himself. His heart was racing, but when he looked over, the wolf was still curled by the door and he sighed with relief at the sight. This was his plan, and Diana had aggressively resisted it because she didn't trust herself, and that was why Cameron had known it was so necessary. He could still remember the night she was bitten. It was raining, and she had been trying to make it home from work, driving slowly. She had him on speakerphone because the rain was coming down hard and he knew visibility would be terrible. Then she saw the body in the road. Cameron had been asking frequent questions, but she answered none of them aside from telling him that she didn't hit anyone. But I almost ran them over, she said next. They're just lying face down in the road. I'm going to see if they're alive. Call for help. I'll call when you're back in the car and I know you're all right. I can call myself then. Diana said with obvious irritation. Then a car door slammed, and Cameron's heartbeat matched it. He sat with his phone staring at the window 
and the rain that hit so hard he was convinced it would break. He was willing her to return, to be okay. Then he heard her scream and he gasped, squeezing his phone. Cameron was asking over and over if she was alright, begging her to tell him what was happening. The phone call disconnected. When Diana had made it home that night, Cameron was already outside in the deluge waiting on her with no jacket. He ran towards the headlight beams that cut through the rain. He was about to go looking for her despite not knowing what road she was on or where on that road she was. He couldn't bear to wait any longer. Then the lights sliced through the downpour and he gasped and ran towards them. He didn't realize at the time that Diana was injured. Between the wound, the fear, and the rain, she couldn't see him at all and she hit him with the car, throwing him to the pavement where he blacked out. It was Cameron that woke up in the hospital bed with broken ribs, a sprained ankle, and a concussion. One of the broken ribs had punctured a lung. Diana was sitting next to him holding his hand. I'm so sorry, she told him. Cameron remembered that moment, the confusion, the fear, the headache. He blinked and stared at her, memories of her scream bellowing in his mind. What happened? What happened to you? He asked. She had just stared at him for a moment, her eyes lost in her own memories, her face a mask of fear. Tell me, he pleaded. You said there was a body. I heard you scream, Diana. I need to know. She looked around the room to make sure there were no prying ears and then she told him about the wolf. The person in the road was long past dead and they hadn't been hit by a car. Their throat had been torn away, their blood cascading in a river across the rain-soaked street. Diana heard the growl and looked up to see the animal that had killed the man at her feet. Even though it was on all fours, the size was intimidating. She could see even in the pouring rain that the animal was bigger than she was. Its golden eyes fixed on her and its lips peeled back in a snarl that showed her the giant jagged teeth lining its enormous jaw. She didn't hesitate. She ran for the car. Diana had closed the door because of the rain, so she had to open it, and that split second was enough for the monster to spring forward and grab the meat of her calf with those teeth. That was the scream Cameron had heard through the phone, the phone she had reached for and dropped onto the rain-soaked street, ending the call. She knew if she let the creature drag her away, she was as dead as the man she almost ran over. I pulled away, let my own leg tear, to escape. Be glad you didn't hear the rest of the screams, she told him. She got in and slammed the door and hit the gas with her bleeding leg. She screamed in agony as she sped home, losing blood. Then she screamed one last time when Cameron appeared before her and she couldn't stop in time. Let me see your leg. Cameron said. They fixed it. They didn't have to. Diana said with a frown, her mouth quivering like she was going to cry. It repaired itself. I don't know how. I don't understand anything that happened. I thought I killed you. When the day came that she first turned, their physical wounds had all long gone and they were just working to get over the emotional trauma of it all. Cameron hadn't seen her turn. He'd actually thought that the wolf had come back for her. It was a crazy thought, but still more rational than what had actually transpired. He looked for her for hours before finding her back at home, naked on the doorstep, covered in blood that wasn't her own. Diana had been suicidal after that. She told him of her experience and how she had no control. She had been there but it was like she was watching through the keyhole of a door as the wolf that now owned her had torn someone to pieces, eaten them. She vomited as she recalled the tale. Cameron had simply listened and rubbed her back, put her in the bathtub, and helped clean off the blood. He knew after that that if she didn't find a way to control the beast, she was going to die. He was going to lose her, and he wasn't ready to. He knew if there was anyone she would fight for, she would resist the monster to keep from killing. It was him. That's when he devised the plan to put himself on a platter for her. She couldn't escape that room, so no one else was in danger, and she would learn how to control the wolf instead of being controlled by it. It's the only way, he had said. I can't. Diana wouldn't even look at him. 
I almost killed you once. I'm not going to finish the job. No, you're not. That's the point. You need to see that to understand your own personal power. You have to trust me. I don't trust myself. Exactly. And you need to in order to beat this thing. I know you. I trust you. It's going to work. Diana had snarled like the wolf that hid within her then. Cameron made sure not to jump or even flinch. He couldn't for a single moment show any fear of her. He knew she would run with that, and his plan would be trashed. He just frowned and took a slow, deep breath to calm his nerves. You weren't there, with me, inside the beast, she told him, the anger still adding an edge to her voice. You don't know what it felt like to be trapped inside and watching the violence. If that had been you on the other end... Cameron had watched the anger leave her then. He wrapped his arms around her and pulled her close. It won't be, he said quietly. You won't let it, but you need that push. Please, don't do it because you believe in me, Diana. Have faith in yourself. I just don't know. He had continued working on it until the next full moon, the night the beast in her would rise again. Tonight. Watching her turn had been agonizing. He could only imagine what it had been like for her to experience. He flinched again, just remembering the sound of her breaking bones. She hadn't killed him, though. At least not outright. Now he looked over at the slowly moving body of the resting wolf curled up by the door with sympathy instead of fear. He wished he could walk over and lay with her, wrap his arms around her furry torso. It was probably for his benefit in this instance that the shackles kept him from doing so. Instead, he let his body fall relaxed, and he allowed himself to doze once more. This time, it was the feeling of being watched that made his eyes flick open. The eyes stared directly into his, made his breath catch in his chest. He could hear the sniffing nose nearby and taste the wolf's sour breath. Cameron knew it had to be hungry, maybe even desperate for a kill. It was no ordinary animal that possessed a human. It was something far more sinister. Something demonic. Cameron was trembling. He could feel the tips of the wolf's claws dragging over his chest and stomach, gently for the moment. But for how long? Cameron moved his arms slowly, the chains jingling with his effort. He let his hands find the wolf's soft fur, and he let his fingers sink in. He massaged like he would a pet dog. The beast rumbled, and Cameron fought not to jerk his hands away. He spoke calmly and quietly in as soothing a tone as fear would allow him when he said, You don't want to hurt me. That's the last thing you want to do. You know me. You love me, Diana. You love me. The wolf jerked out of his grasp then, rising to its full height, almost a foot taller than Diana stood in her human form. It reared back and howled loudly, body rigid with tensed muscles. Then it moved. It was so fast that Cameron wasn't able to restrain the gasp. It was a blur of fur as the beast's arm slashed towards him. The claws on his giant right paw cut through one of the chains and dropped Cameron awkwardly to the mattress. He landed on his shoulders strangely and grimaced in pain, but his eyes remained focused on the thing that had been his wife only hours ago. He spoke her name quietly in repetition like a mantra against the terror that gripped him. The wolf looked down at him and snarled, shaking its head rapidly back and forth like it was trying to tear something only it could see. Then it turned and flew towards the door. The metal creaked and groaned against its weight as they collided. The wolf dove back and charged the door again. It continued to use its own body as a battering ram, howling and snarling wildly as Cameron looked on in horror. He was beginning to wonder if the door would hold. Finally, the beast relaxed and slumped back to the ground. Cameron couldn't help but wonder if it was actually trying to escape or if that had been Diana forcing the monster to focus its anger somewhere else. He stood so he could look at the watch on his still-shackled wrist. It was 4 a.m. There were only a few hours of night left. When the sun rose, Diana would return to him. We're gonna make it, he thought. We're gonna make it. There was no way Cameron was going to fall back to sleep, 
so he leaned against the wall and just watched. He watched his wife doing what he knew she was capable of, regaining control, overpowering the animal. After a few minutes, the wolf got back to its feet and it just walked in slow circles. Then it laid back down. A little while later, it was up again. It paced and walked, claws clacking on the ground. Then it lost it and slammed against the door again, over and over, just like before. Cameron's heart ached as he watched this song and dance. Tears filled his eyes. Diana was trying so hard. She was fighting. He loved her with every ounce of himself. When the wolf relaxed this time, there was blood on the door. Cameron cringed at the sight. He hoped she didn't kill herself trying not to kill him. No, we're gonna make it, he told himself. Minutes later, she was up again, pacing and snarling. Cameron wanted to tell her it was okay, to talk her down and tell her to be calm, but he knew that she was walking a thin line and just speaking could send her his way in a fury, so he bit his tongue. He grit his teeth as the wolf collided with the door over and over. It was so full of rage and violence. He sighed when she finally relaxed and fell back to the floor. Silently, he pleaded for her assault on the door to be finished. For a while, it seemed that it was. Then she rose again, and this time she skipped the pacing and just went right at the wall of steel blocking her exit. The giant animal launched itself at the door again and again, and the bangs echoed through the room. The metal groaned and the blood stain spread. Cameron couldn't take it anymore. He screamed, Stop! The animal did as he asked, paused, still as can be, on its raised-up haunches, but hunched over, its back curled like a rainbow. Slowly, it turned its head towards him and snarled. "'Please stop,' Cameron pleaded. "'Please!' The wolf showed its impossible speed again when it spun around and launched itself his direction. Before he even understood what was happening, the other chain was severed and Cameron was collapsing to the mattress below him. He was glad that he made the decision to put it there, or he would have hit the ground hard." Cameron's ears were filled with the wolf's roar of unbridled anger. Then it was on him. Its giant paws pinned his shoulders and it stared down into his eyes. Drool poured from those ferocious teeth onto his face. It's me, he said to the snarling monster. It's me, Diana. It's me. But Cameron saw no recognition in those predatory eyes, only hunger. The wolf's tongue emerged and lapped at the air. Its nose moved and jumped as it sniffed at him. Cameron closed his eyes and waited for death. He heard horrible sounds then. There were roars of hunger and pain, sounds like slabs of meat being dropped out of a bucket onto the floor, furious snapping and crunching, scraping nails on stone, moans and a strange slithering like wet snakes wrestling in a lake of blood. Cameron opened his eyes just as a naked Diana fell upon him. He took a sharp breath. Diana was unconscious and obviously injured, but she was alive. He could feel the moving of her chest as she breathed above him. The sun had risen, and they were both alive. Cameron just wrapped his arms around his wife's naked form and he held her, so relieved to feel the contours of her flesh and not animal fur. He kissed her bruised, swollen forehead. I knew you could do it, he whispered. I knew you would. I knew it. Diana's only response was a quiet snore, her shoulders moving up and down as she slept soundly upon his chest. Cameron took a deep breath, and his head fell back to the mattress. One hand rubbed his wife's back, and the other ran gently through her hair as he stared up at the ceiling. I love you. Why didn't I listen to him? I just had to keep doing it, didn't I? All right, I'm getting as much as I can out while I still have any strength left to do so. I'd been on a fitness kick for about seven or eight months now, and to call it an addiction would be putting it lightly. I'd always struggled with self-esteem, so I decided to do something about it through fitness. Classic tale, right? Well, you know how it goes. You start telling yourself that, oh, just go to the gym and 
everything will be all right. Right? So then you do it. You get involved in fitness classes, see all the gurus and hear their bullshit about personal fitness and inner well-being, and you even start losing large amounts of money, diving headfirst into crippling debt, into all these dietary and workout supplements. Now, imagine all of that, and then take into account that my stupid ass had also started throwing myself at just about every goddamn opportunity to volunteer for any number of tests for some new products. And obviously, yes, this resulted in numerous hospital visits, incurring more debt. And which also eventually got to the point where my ass couldn't even go to the gym anymore because of the extensive damage many of the different chemicals and treatments had done to my body. All of this, and you know what? I still looked flabby and pathetic. So I looked like shit, felt like shit, and didn't have a shit to show for it all. About month five was the point where I was about to give up on everything. I was already without a car, having to sell it after losing my job thanks to the hospital visits. I didn't have much of anything inside my house either, and I was just barely able to pay the rent and put a little food in my mouth every night, mostly consisting of ramen and canned tuna. Top all of that off, the rent was coming due at the end of the month and it looked like I was going to have to choose whether or not I wanted a roof or food for the next month. I was running out of shit to take to the pawn shop, too, so I wasn't going to be able to have that to bail me out much longer either. The only thing I had left of any real value was my grandfather's old Smith & Wesson, which was so old that I didn't figure it'd get me much. Might as well use it on myself at this point, right? Bad joke. I know. Though make no mistake, the thought had come up more than once. As a matter of fact, it was at one point I had the thing in my hand, fervently pondering the idea. Then the doorbell rang. Just caught me off guard because, naturally... Penniless junkies like me didn't exactly have much in the luxury of friends, and my family were all in another state, so visitors weren't a common occurrence. I sat on my couch for a moment, not sure if maybe they just had the wrong apartment, when the doorbell started ringing repeatedly. I got up, then slugged my way over to the door. Uh, hello? I said, answering the door. Greeting me was who I figured must have been the model for at least the past five issues of men's fitness, smirking at me with a pamphlet in his hand. The instant I saw that, I rolled my eyes. Great, a goddamn missionary. Hello, sir. I was just in the neighborhood and wondered if I could have a moment of your time. He kept up this absolutely plastic smirk every second he said this, too. Swear to God, if he comes at me with some Lord and Savior bullshit, I'm fucking losing it with him. He held up the pamphlet. You see, I've been doing a study on the effects of poor society conditions on the people in it when it comes to fitness. I scoffed. Another yogi. Even worse. Ah. Uh. That right? I asked, dryly. Yes, sir. See, our theory is that those in poor living conditions are far more predisposed to obesity and being out of shape than those in more. He hesitated for a moment, trying to find the right word. In a better condition? Yeah, you get it. I sighed pinching the bridge of my nose, and then said, Okay, well, look, pal, as you can plainly see, I paused and showed him the inside of my house. 
I don't have any money for whatever the hell it is you're selling here, so... Oh, no, sir. I apologize for the misunderstanding. I'm not here to sell anybody anything. Like I said, this is a study. Okay, then. Why the hell are you here? He chuckled. Great question. May I come in? I looked at him for a moment, honestly not sure if this was some sort of prank. I even started looking around outside to see if this asshat was being followed by some kind of film crew. I mean, not that I'd really throw a fit if this was all some sort of televised prank, but damn it, I was going to make sure I got my cut from it. He chuckled again. It's just me, sir. Get this reaction a lot? I asked. Oh, only from everyone else I've asked this too here in this neighborhood. Figures. So may we talk inside. I scoffed and stepped aside. He came in and I saw him look at the place up and down. Uh-huh. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm seeing everything I need. Guess you didn't need much, huh? I joked. He didn't react. So, uh, exactly what is it that you're looking for? Ah, yes. So what I want to do is ask you just a few short questions about your lifestyle, and then we can go from there, okay? More questions. fan fucking -tastic. Fire away, I replied tiredly. Right on. So, first question. How much do you make per year? This made me chuckle dryly and nod around the apartment. Take a good look around and then take into consideration that I'm in danger of losing all of this anyway. That's how much. He nodded and kept going. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. while looking around the room. And what all do you eat on a regular basis? I looked over and pulled out an old container of top ramen and held it up to him. He raised his eyebrows and asked, That it? Pretty much, I mean, if I'm extra lucky, I can actually have a can or two of tuna to mix with them. I see. Yeah. So is that it? You know what kind of condition I live in, so... Not just yet, he said, holding his finger up. What I don't know is why. I frowned. Huh? Why is it that you have to live this way? In here, eating ramen and tuna every night? I raised my eyebrow. This guy wasn't serious, was he? He was really asking me to tell him why I was dirt-ass poor, for fuck's sake. Taking a deep breath, clenching both my teeth and fists, I told him, Look, obviously, I'm not the best with money and I don't have a job. Made some shit decisions financially, and I'm paying for them enough, in my opinion, without you throwing them in my fucking face. So... You feel horrible about yourself, don't you? I froze. What did you say? You feel like shit, don't you? I'm sorry, who the hell are you? You feel like you're a failure, don't you? My ears started to burn. In only milliseconds, I had every possible thought every detail of ways to pound Mr. Men's warehouse here into a pile of blood and bones twitching on the floor. You want to change, don't you? <laughs> and I suppose you have some miracle, Mr. Messiah, huh? You gonna snap your fingers and make all my fucking money issues go away? Jesus H. Christ, you're worse than my goddamn therapist was. At least she knew when to quit while she was ahead. But I am still ahead. He replied nonchalantly, 
not noticing and or not caring about the fact that I was about to beat his ass. Oh, huh, I'll bet. I begin to walk to the kitchen. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to enjoy my pack of ramen for tonight in peace. I'd offer you some, but, you know, us slummers gotta hold on to what we got. So if you would please. I gestured to the front door. He stood in the middle of the living room, squinting his eyes at me. Well, what, you need a fucking invitation? Go! His smug-as-hell grin grew. Look, if I have to say it again, I'm going to call the fucking cops. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Again, just here to ask a couple questions and offer you some help. Yeah? Well, I don't need your help. Understood. Again. But, if you change your mind... He pulled out a card and what looked like some sort of small pill bottle. The opportunity will be there. He set the bottle and the card down on the floor and walked out without another word or glance in my direction. I stood for a minute, watching him walk down the street. Good riddance, jackass. When I was sure he was gone, I looked again at the pill bottle. Inside was what looked like a roll of bills and a few small pills. On the card, small red text read, In the event you want to change your mind and your life, take one of these pride pills. I've gifted you $1,000 in the hopes that you'll try the formula contained in the bottle. If you wish to pocket the money, that is fine. It is yours to play with, though, should you decide that you would like a substantially larger compensation. Then take the pills. There is a seven-day supply. Take no more than one per day, and make sure you eat something right after, not before each use. At the end of the seven-day period, Contact the number on the back of the card and directions will be given on how to proceed further with the trial. Sincerely, L. Rorickson, CEO of Vanity Wings, LLC. I couldn't help but chuckle at this when I first read it. I run this asshole out of my house after getting passively chastised about my living conditions. And I get to come out with a thousand dollars because of it. Fucking dumbass, I thought. Then the longer I stared at the pill bottle, the more curious I got about the so-called pride pills. Which sounds so weird, by the way. Seriously, who came up with that marketing campaign? And so, I thought about taking one. Then, of course, common sense kicked in and told me to quit being an idiot just take the money and flush the pills or something. Still, though, I couldn't really tell why at the time, but I couldn't shake the thought from my mind that there was something about these pills. Something that told me that maybe, just... Maybe... I shouldn't be so quick to get rid of them. I wondered if maybe they could somehow help me. I mean, like I said earlier... I have done this sort of thing before. What difference was this, right? Sure, I can hear you telling me now, but didn't you say that was also the same thing that screwed you in the first place? Answer, yes it was. And to answer your next question, yes. I realize I'm an idiot for basically willingly screwing myself over again. But keep two things in mind here. A. None of this. Me telling you what happened to me is for sympathy. I'm just looking to tell you what happened to spread a warning. And B, I didn't immediately rush head first into taking the pills. I started by asking around my neighborhood. The fucker did say he'd been giving them the same pitch he had me, so I figured maybe one of them might have had some sort of answer or result to show me regarding the pills. 
I thought if they did, and they turned out fine, then it might not be such a horrible idea to participate in another test run trial. If nothing else, then to maybe score another payout. I started by going to my next door neighbor's house and knocking on his door. Almost unsurprisingly, he didn't answer. People weren't too keen on answering the doors around here unexpectedly, if you know what I mean. After knocking for a good five to ten minutes, the motherfucker opened the door, looking about as annoyed and tired as he always did whenever I'd see him step out of his apartment for the singular occasion of grabbing the morning paper or checking his mailbox. The hell do you want? Hey, just, uh, I don't know. Thought I'd try and, you know, see how everything was going. He raised an eyebrow at me. I'm honestly surprised he didn't either slam the door in my face or bust his gut laughing. I cleared my throat and started again. Okay, look, bullshit aside, did you get a visit from that guy in the suit? Pretty boy wanted to stick his nose in my business. Yeah, he came by, but had my foot in his ass too. I chuckled at this. Makes two of us, pal. Okay, so, he left you a bottle too, right? Yeah, why? Well, cause I just got done running him off myself. And I got one, too. You know what's in it, right? Yeah, some pills than the next three months' rent. (laughs) Look, you gonna start poking around my business, too? I held up my hands. Hey, I'm just asking, okay? I just wanted to know if you'd taken them, and if any funny shit was happening. No, I ain't taking them. I don't plan to, either. Stupid ass gave me a grand, and I'm gonna use it to keep the roof over my head for the next three months. He then thrust the bottle of pills into my chest. Here, matter of fact, you can have my supply. Shit, maybe it'll do you some good. (laughs) Maybe make you look less like a wad of bubblegum. He turned and slammed the door in my face. I just stood there looking at the bottle he just gave me. Dick, all I wanted to ask was one fucking question. I turned around, considering whether or not it'd be worth it to try and ask anyone else. Then I thought about how likely it was that I'd just get the exact goddamn answer. Likely along with a black eye or something for my troubles as well. So no, instead, I went back to my house and was right back to thinking about what the hell I was going to do with all of these pills. I wanted to throw them out, of course. Like my neighbor said, it was at least three or four months worth of rent, just for listening to a suit try to jack me off for twenty minutes. And then there's the chance for more. That's when I started free-falling into the rabbit hole. Yeah, the money I had was great and all, But what had happened when the money was gone? I'd be right back to where I was now, on the verge of being without a fucking roof over my head, and even then, I won't even have the goddamn money throughout to eat properly anyway. I'd have the apartment for another three months, but I'd still be stuck eating ramen every fucking night for those three months. I didn't want that. I wanted more. If there was a chance here that I could live comfortably, I wanted it. And you best believe I'd do what it took. That night, as per the instructions, I took one pill and immediately made a pack of ramen and tuna. I'll say this much. I'm glad the card emphasized to take only one and right before you ate something. That thing... As soon as it slithered down and hit the pit of my stomach, I had the munchies like you wouldn't believe. It was like it had burned a hole in my stomach, leaving it as this giant, gaping crater. It tasted delicious, too. It was sweet, but with just enough of a savory sort of tang so it wasn't alarmingly sweet. I devoured that pack of ramen and almost immediately went for another pack. I only had about another week's supply on my counter, and in the next ten minutes, I ended up burning through at least another five or six packets. I can't really tell how many packets of ramen I went through in total. 
but when I woke up, some five or six hours later, I saw that at least three-fourths of my stash was gone. Great job, fat ass. Now you're going to have to buy more of that with all the money you don't... I stopped then. I realized two things. The first was the whole, oh yeah, $1,000, must have forgot. As well as the added security of knowing that at the end of the week, I'd have significantly more after the trial was done. The second thing I noticed was when I looked at my reflection in the mirror at the end of the hall. I noticed just how much thinner I looked. Now, something to clear up. I wasn't exactly fat. Not like you might be thinking anyway but I was kind of flabby in a few areas. Let me put it to you this way. Girls would have looked at me and rated me a 4 or 5 out of 10 at best. Hence why I had done all the shit that got me into the mess I was in in the first place. Now, though, I noticed how much my waistline had slimmed up. I wasn't as wide as I was before in the waist, and ironically enough, it was then that I noticed, also, how my pants were starting to feel a good bit looser than they had been. Now keep in mind, I hadn't been exercising, or even leaving my fucking house for that matter, and I'd just pigged out like crazy on ramen noodles. In other words, not at all a weight loss sort of circumstance, if you know what I mean. And yet, here I was, looking already ten, maybe. Fifteen pounds lighter. Hell, as a matter of fact, I even stepped on my old bathroom scale, which somehow still worked, don't ask how, and saw that, yeah, I was actually ten pounds lighter than I had been before. I was flabbergasted, to say the least. I couldn't believe it, despite not being able to disprove it. I wasn't a man of any kind of faith, but... This was what I could only realize was a miracle. After all the money lost, all the impoverishment, all the fucking time spent breaking myself with chemicals and supplements and shit, it was finally all over. I found the miracle pill. I remember actually going out of my house, feeling something like a sense of actual confidence in myself. I could actually be proud of myself for once. Imagine that, a loser like me that could actually feel good about themselves after just one pill. I went outside and actually decided to take a giant whiff of the air like a goddamn hippie. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was absolutely euphoric. It wasn't just my euphoria that was sent through the roof either. I got hit with a libido I hadn't had in years. If even that, to be perfectly honest. With all the money I had now to boot, it meant I could actually go out and, you know, actually live a little. So I did. I went to the bar, though it was a little awkward going with no friends. Went to the movies. Shit, I even went to a fancy-as-hell five-star restaurant. That's where I first started noticing something. It had been prevalent before at all the other places, but it wasn't as apparent as it was in the restaurant. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet, and it had everything, ranging from your standard salad bar at the front to the dessert bar at the very end, with just about every kind of fancy cut of meat and other shit in between them. Like I said, I'd been eating all day at all the other places I'd mentioned before, and eating well, I might add. But I get in that restaurant, and it was like a hole had just been burned through my stomach. With the way it roared at me, I might as damn well not have eaten anything that day. So I get through the door, and it was everything I could do to not run buck wild tearing the place apart. Have you ever seen an alcoholic when he's at a party and he's trying to stay sober? The way he shakes like he's going to spontaneously explode? That's what it was like for me only with a lot more saliva in my mouth. I finally managed to make it through the line to the counter to pay for the table and food, but the instant I was able to break away from the counter, it was on. I bum-rushed the end of the line to the salad bar where I proceeded to devour the entire spread. 
I didn't wait in line, use the tongs. Hell, I didn't even grab a damn bowl. I was on a feeding frenzy and there was no stopping now. The lettuce, the croutons, the other various condiments, all of them. I was shoveling it all in hand over fist. Oh, and it didn't stop there. Oh, no. It escalated at the entree sections, where I started snatching chunks out of every hunk of perfectly cooked, dripping, juicy hunk of meat in front of me. Mentally, I was nothing but a wild fucking animal, and from the way my mouth and chin dripped with blood from the deliciously tender prime ribs and ribeyes, I probably looked like one, too. Oh, I couldn't stop. I didn't want to. I couldn't remember the last time, if really ever, that I'd ever tasted or eaten food this good before, and I couldn't get enough. No, seriously, I actually couldn't get enough to eat, no matter how much I shoveled in, no matter how big the bites were or what they were. To me, it was like I was eating only slices of bread. Eating all of that food felt no different to me than eating my meager portions of ramen every night. The baby backs, the quarter pound steaks, the New York strips, the chicken, the fish, all of it. Gone in seconds, the instant I got to them. And I still had to have more. Obviously, none of this was going unnoticed. The others in line in front of me and behind me were starting to give me dirty looks. Not that I could have cared. It was only a matter of time, though, before I saw two of the restaurant staff approaching me, and without even thinking, I lunged at one of them, tackling them to the ground before raising up. What had possessed me to do this, I couldn't begin to know. But the thought crossed my mind then to... to, well, to try taking chunks out of him. Right before I could, I was hoisted off by the other before being thrown out the door like I was yesterday's garbage. I landed on my face, which caused my vision to explode into a giant cloud. It was at least ten minutes, though, before any of that even registered with me. When it did, it was almost another twenty minutes before I was in any condition to try and pick myself up off the ground. From there, walking was an absolute nightmare thanks to the excruciating pain shooting all throughout my body. What was worse? I was still hungry. About an hour or two later and I made it home. And what's the first thing I do? That's right. Pig the fuck out of the rest of the ramen I had, stashed somewhere in the house. All packs of them. Gone. I didn't even cook them either. Instead, I just chowed down on them like they were giant crackers. Once I was through those, I tore through my cabinets to devour ten, maybe fifteen cans of tuna I'd managed to ration that long up until that point. All of that, plus the frenzy from the restaurant, plus all the shit I ate earlier throughout the day. And it still wasn't enough. I wanted more. <sighs> And something to keep in mind. I know I keep saying this, but I couldn't feel any of it. When I looked in the mirror again, there wasn't so much as a fucking bulge in my stomach. Believe it or not, it was actually smaller. My stomach was shrinking. Using the remote part of my brain that was actually still reasonable, I decided to turn in for the night. And though I was still ravenous as a rabid dog, I did my best to shove it all down. It was a long night, I'll tell you that much. But eventually I managed to make it work, and I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, I felt normal again. My stomach felt normal again. Sort of. What I mean is that I felt full, satisfied. Well, fed. Something you know by now wasn't ever the case for me. The downside of this was that I had a real bitch of a headache. So the first thing I ended up doing was going to the drugstore across the street for some aspirin. I got back home and popped the pill, and lo and behold, that was a horrible idea. 
Not ten seconds after I pop the fucker, my vision starts warping like crazy. Imagine for a moment that you're on a roller coaster and you can't make anything stop spinning. Now imagine that happening for ten minutes straight while you're throwing up. Pleasant, ain't it? Anyway, after herking until my stomach felt like an empty mason jar again, you guessed it. I was fucking starving again. Real bad, too, in fact. I wasn't just starving. I was ravenous. I wanted to eat any and everything in sight. You might think that that's an exaggeration, but oh no. I spent at least five minutes trying to eat my damn couch, right after somehow managing to take a bite out of two of the little cork coasters I had, before realizing that these were things that weren't meant to be eaten. Even still, I had to eat something. Thing was, I didn't want just anything. I didn't want just any food. No, see, I'd already tried regular food at the restaurant, and none of it worked. I was still so hungry. I looked in the mirror again, and you know what? My stomach was now concave. I was malnourished. Despite eating literally anything and everything. I was going to die if I didn't find something big, something satisfying, and quick. I threw on my coat and began walking down the road, looking all around for a decent place to eat. I still had a good chunk of the money left, and I'd already paid up that month's rent, so I figured I should still be able to afford whatever it was that caught my eye. No... Money wasn't the problem here, for once. This time, the problem was that there wasn't anything that was catching my eye. I mean, sure, there were restaurants left and right, but none that seemed to make me think they'd be able to satisfy my cravings. I wanted meat. Tough yet tender. Juicy and thick. I wanted meat that still had fur on it. I wanted it bloody. In fact, as I was walking, I was imagining myself taking a huge bite into a steak that was so rare, it was debatable as to whether or not the fucking thing was even cooked at all. No. In fact, I wanted it to be that way. Raw. Bleeding. Well, who said it even had to be dead first? I wanted it alive. I wanted it to struggle as I tore into it. My heart thundered in my chest with each step I took down the street, imagining me tearing into a live animal, not even caring about which animal, seeing the life leave its eyes while I stuffed my face like I was a five-year-old at a birthday party. The wind blew and the street was full of people, all walking along the sidewalk. Some of them with pets. Tiny, sweet little dogs. All huffing and yapping excitedly. I looked at them pass me by, and my mouth began to water. Most of them were small, shrimpy little things, which wouldn't have amounted to much more than a quick mouthful. But then there were the few which were nice and big, both in height and girth. Nice, juicy morsels, raw and bloody. My body shook violently. I was so hungry. I needed something. I needed meat. Raw, juicy meat that I could tear apart with my bare hands and teeth. Just, just one. Um. Excuse me? I snapped back to reality, to find myself nose to nose with a golden retriever. Its tongue was lapped out, happily huffing in my face. I looked back up to find the owner, looking alarmed at me. And exactly what on earth do you think you're doing? Um, I, um, uh, uh. I was lost. What was I doing again? My stomach growled. A reminder at me, and I looked back at the dog. Oh, um, 
I was just stopping to check out your pal here. I replied with an awkward as hell chuckle. Big on Haney. Yeah, he replied uneasily. Well, me and Sonny here need to get home soon, so if you wouldn't mind... He gestured with his hand for me to move away from the dog. I didn't move. I was starving and this beautiful pound of flesh was right here. No, 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 I couldn't let this go. I needed the meat. I had to have Sonny. Oh, uh, sure, but uh, you mind if I say hello and pet him first? I could tell from the look on the guy's face that he really just wanted me to go away, but I was persistent. Fine, but make it quick, he said, sighing and rolling his eyes. My arm slowly reached out to Sonny's nose, quivering violently, blissfully unaware of what was about to happen to him the second I laid hands on him. Hey there, Sonny boy, I said in a goading, childlike voice. My hand was almost at his nose. My mouth flooded with saliva. It was there. Perfect, raw, tender meat. It was all mine now. My hand stroked his nose and electricity jolted throughout my entire body. The moist texture of his nose sent shivers down my back. Shivers of anxiety. Of excitement. I imagined how squishy and chewy it would taste in my mouth. Then my heart was sent speeding, when Sonny took it upon himself to start playfully licking my hand. That was it for me. I couldn't take it anymore. Before I, the dog, or the owner could so much as blink, I snatched him by the scruff of his neck and took off sprinting down the road. Behind me, I could hear the guy shout, Hey, stop that guy, he's got my dog! I ignored this. I ignored this, the sounds of the other people coming after me, and I ignored Sonny's yaps at me as I sprinted further and further. Where I was even going, I don't know. I wasn't planning on going home, I'll tell you that. No, I was just running, trying to find a nice, quiet, secluded spot to stop and enjoy this pilfered meal. I don't know how long it was that I was running blindly down the street with the dog in my hands, but I will say that by the time I finally stopped in a darkened, isolated alley on the edge of town, the sun had already mostly gone down. I looked behind me to find that everyone else seemed to have given up the chase some time back as well. I sat down then and looked at Sonny whether from his own excitement or because he'd yapped himself out. He was fast asleep. Good. That means there won't even be a struggle. I laid him down and unhinged my jaws. Just about to pounce. When I stopped. What the hell was going on? I asked myself. What the hell was I doing here? Why was I so sweaty? dirty and out here in the dark sitting with a random dog in the alleyway. What the fuck was wrong with me? My stomach roared at me again. My entire lower stomach felt like jagged shards of glass and red hot needles were being driven repeatedly into it. I doubled over. I couldn't even stand up anymore. I looked up at the dog. The gigantic, juicy, Tender dog. It was right there. I was so hungry. And the solution was right there. Fast asleep. He wouldn't even feel anything. No. I looked away from Sonny again. I couldn't do it. Sonny was a sweet little dog. Why does he have to die just because of my voracious appetite? It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. But God, I was so hungry. In the end, all I'm going to say 
to both the dog and the owner. I'm so, so sorry. I'm a monster. And I hope that he's in some form of paradise now. Wherever that is for dogs. When I finally finished. You know, my stomach roared again. Even after what I'd just done. Even after Sonny. I still couldn't satisfy my hunger. I was still so goddamn hungry. I wanted more. I wanted bigger, even bigger than Sonny. I wanted more fresh meat, fresh blood. I couldn't help it. I, I was out of control completely now. Pain erupted again from my stomach and I clutched it, doubling over and writhing on the ground next to what was left of poor Sonny. I howled and cried, both from pain and grief. I wasn't even a person now. I was a fucking animal, a wild fucking animal that deserved nothing more than to get put down like this one. The worst part, no matter how bad I wanted to stop, I couldn't. I couldn't make any of it end. I couldn't stop being so damn hungry. I thought for a moment that if I could hold out long enough, that I might be able to black out or, hell, even keel over at this point. But no. Eventually the pain became too much and I resorted to the only other supply of meat I knew I still had on me. My own bare flesh. I started by biting my hands, sinking my teeth as far as they'd go before ripping them out of my mouth tearing away more and more of it with each mouthful. The pain was excruciating, believe me, but the pain of hunger was far worse. I didn't stop there, either. I went down the length of my arms, then started tearing bits from my legs. By the time a roving police car, likely called by the owner of Sonny or anyone else from the crowd chasing me, found me, I had to have looked like something out of Night of the Living Dead, with all the tattered flesh and severed tendons hanging out of me. And I wasn't stopping. The immediate aftermath is a blur. I've been told that they had to tase me several times before they could restrain me. I don't remember any of it, though, obviously. How I could manage to be so defensive in such a state. No, I just remember waking up in a hospital bed with bandages covering three-fourths of my whole body and tubes going into several places. Like before... I woke up with an awful headache and I couldn't move a single muscle. The sharp pain from before also returned, only now the adrenaline wasn't there to mute it out. I've spent the last three, four, maybe five days here in the hospital. It was only last night that I managed to start sort of moving my fingers again. I don't feel hungry anymore or anything. So I guess that's one sort of silver lining from all of this. On the other hand, I'm being told by the doctors that, thanks to the self-inflicted lacerations of my skin and muscle tissues, it's likely I'll end up having to have them amputated. When they did a tox screening on me, they found, of course, the chemicals of the pride pills, which comprised of a laundry list of chemicals that, honestly, I didn't care to remember. Nor were they ones I'd even heard of before. When they asked me about it, I told them about L. Rorickson and Vanity Wings, LLC. 
both of which earned me a confused look from both the doctors and the detectives who questioned me about the situation, both with Sonny and the restaurant before. I told them that I wasn't the only one he'd visited either, that he'd made the same offer, gave the same stuff to everyone else in my neighborhood as well. When they searched for the company online, however, you guessed it. Zilch Zero. I told them that the card he gave me was in my apartment as well, and that the same card was with the pill supply he'd given to the others. I was told they'd be looking into that before they left. That was two days ago and have not heard anything from it since. I'm ending this here because I'm going to be undergoing some sort of operation here in an hour. I'm going to post this, and I'm going to beg you all, please, for the love of fucking God, don't ever try any kind of experimental drug no matter how much money is thrown at you for it, it's not worth it. I grew up in a family that always struggled with money. I wish I could say we made the best of our situation, but that would be the worst kind of lie. The kind that lets my father off the hook. He was a destructive, overbearing force in our lives. And he had a temper that made our house feel like we were living with a sleeping bear that no one dared poke. My mother, sweet and caring as she was to me, and my sister Addie, was no match for him. She barely managed to hold on to the light in her eyes, and it faded year after year. The worst part of my father, thinking back, was always the time just before the yelling. It was the look on his face. That expression that meant he was about to start shouting and throwing things. It wasn't what you'd think it might be. A flash of angry fire in his eyes. No, it was just the slightest hint of a smile. A smile that told me he enjoyed being the monster. As rough as life was, growing up with a little sister meant I couldn't let myself sit around and wallow in misery. I may have only been three years older than she was, but I felt fully responsible for her. It was my job to protect her, most of all for my father, who for some reason picked at Addie more than he did the rest of us. Maybe it was her trusting nature, her innocence. Leave it to my father to see kindness as a weakness. Almost daily he would find something to yell at her for, and since I wouldn't dare defend her or yell back, I started acting out. I'd do things that pulled his attention away from her and put it on me. I was a good kid once, a well-behaved kid. But for Addie to protect her the way an older brother should, I didn't just seek out trouble. I became it. I did anything and everything I could think of to upset and disappoint my father. It made him so angry, in fact, that he practically forgot Addie existed. He spent so much time screaming at me for this thing or that, he hardly said a word to her. For most parents, to forget a child would be neglect, but coming from my father, it would be the opposite. The more he ignored her, the better she did. For every spanking I took, Addie read a book. For every hour I spent in detention, every ride home I received from the truant officer, she had time to breathe and grow. I lied and cheated and stole for her. It wasn't much, but it was dishonest work. Away from my father's blinding spotlight, Addie flourished. One summer, though, the year Addie turned eight, that all changed, and for once it wasn't my father's fault. It was a particularly hot Friday night. My parents were watching one of the documentaries my father liked so much, something about dictators. I was reading comics under the covers after being sent to bed early. Writing on the wall at church, I believe, was my crime. When the most awful scream I'd ever heard broke the quiet. It was so brutal and almost inhuman shrieking that it took a few seconds to register who was making the sound. 
Addie. I burst from my makeshift tent and tore out of my room so fast I nearly pulled my arm out of its socket on the door frame. My parents were already ahead of me, crowded around Addie's bed at the end of the hall. For a second I thought it was my father making Addie scream like that, and in that second, no matter what consequences would follow, I was prepared to pound my fist into the side of his head to get him away from her. It probably would have been the last thing I ever did, but it would have been worth it. Except it wasn't my father doing it. He and my mother were actually trying to get Addie to stop screaming, both of them shaking her arms and asking her what had happened. It sounded as if she had a nightmare, but she was speaking so fast and with so little breath that I could barely make out a word of what she was saying. The only thing I could tell for sure was that she was looking at her window with an expression on her face like she was looking at hell itself. I tried asking her what had happened, but my father only shouted at me to get back to bed. My mother, pale and thin in her nightgown, led me back down the hallway to my room. She assured me that Addie had just had a bad dream, and everything was going to be fine. Before she left to return to Addie's room, she gave me a kiss on my forehead, the way she did when my father wasn't looking. It was the first in a long time I'd seen my mother without the long sleeves she always wore. As she leaned in, I saw a small collection of bruises on her arms and shoulders. Some were old and gray, some fresher, thumbprints painted in purple and yellow. She must have noticed me looking because her eyes went wide and then she closed my door and hurried away, back down the hollow hallway. I stood in front of that door for nearly an hour, feeling the throbbing in my arm, listening to my parents calm Addie down, trying to convince her that bad dreams couldn't hurt her. But over and over, Addie told my parents that she hadn't been sleeping, that she hadn't been dreaming. The next morning, I snuck into Addie's room early, before my parents came out of their room, to ask her what had happened to make her scream like that. But she was already gone. Her pajamas were folded and neatly stacked on her dresser. Her sneakers were gone. Even her bed was made, creased the way my father expected us to every morning. Only one thing was different from how she usually left her room. The shades on her windows weren't pulled up leaving the usually bright pink room a dull, flesh-colored hue. It wasn't like Addie to leave her room so dark, and it reminded me how she stared at the window with that terrible look on her face. In the kitchen, I found my mother at the table. She quietly stirred a cup of coffee, staring at a spot on the wall. She looked like she hadn't slept, especially when she tried to smile at me, but came up empty, her eyes heavy with purple skin. I tried not to think of what else I'd seen, the secret she hid under those long sleeves. Where's Addie? I asked. She moved to the refrigerator to retrieve a carton of eggs, glancing at me, almost surprised by the question, as if she expected me to just forget everything from the night before. Your sister isn't well, my mother said carefully. I know. She was scared of something. The stove clicked on with a hard snap. My mother paused a moment, picking her words. Travis, sometimes when people are under a lot of stress, they can make up things that aren't really there. Addie's not a liar, I said angrily. No, not lies. It's more like seeing things. Things you swear are real but can't possibly be. Where's Addie? I repeated over the sound of sizzling oil. She took a breath. Your father thought it would be best if she saw a doctor. My skin heated up faster than the pan on the stovetop. Addie doesn't need a doctor. She needs help. I said, then added, We all do. My mother spun, closing the distance between us in a second. She raised her hand so quickly I thought she was about to hit me. I flinched. But she was only raising her finger at me, pushing it in my face. Don't you dare let him hear you say that, she hissed, looking like a cornered animal lashing out. Tears jumped to her eyes as she caught her hand and lowered it. Before she did, though, I caught the sight of another bruise, a new one, just below the wrist. She alone knew how many there really were, except for maybe God, if he bothered to check in. 
My mouth opened, an apology trying its best to bubble up from my throat, but I couldn't get it out. The moment passed. My mother wiped her face and returned to the stove as if none of it had happened. It was a skill she'd been practicing for years. Avoidance and denial. The ability to shut a door and keep moving as if the last room never existed. With the pan hot enough, my mother took an egg from the carton to start making breakfast. She paused, an odd look on her face, and turned the egg over a few times as if weighing it. I asked her what was wrong, but she didn't dare hear me. Shaking the egg once, twice, she cracked it against the lip of the pan, and it sounded wrong somehow, far too brittle. Then she pushed her thumbs into the cracks and spread the egg open in one movement. It was empty. No yolk, no whites. Nothing but emptiness. Placing the empty shell to the side, she grabbed for another egg. But again, by her expression, I could tell it was wrong. She cracked it against the pan, and again it came up empty. She grabbed another, but she didn't bother cracking it against the pan this time. Just crushed it in her palm, the sound of dry crackling filling her hand. One after the other, she crushed the eggs finding not a single usable one among them. Without any warning, she threw the last one down, then rushed from the kitchen, slamming her bedroom door shut. I sat silently for a few seconds. Then I got up and turned off the stove, moving the pan away from the heat. As the oil cooled, I threw out the empty shells and cleaned up the scattered pieces I could find, including those that had fallen to the floor. They were hollow shells, every one, just like us. Our house was small, tiny even, and when things were going bad, it felt even smaller. Like a belt squeezing around my neck, tightening down on my throat until my lungs burned. But my father and sister gone, and my mother crying softly in her room, I needed some air. Our backyard was nothing more than a worn-out desk, overlooking a patch of crabgrass and dead tree roots. But it did have one thing going for it. Trees. The far end of our backyard ended at the start of a wooded area, maybe nine or ten acres across. That, as far as I was aware, didn't belong to anyone. That meant I had free reign over it. I could explore it as much as I wanted without risk of getting in trouble, other than obviously my father. Frankly, he didn't care what I got up to in there so long as I re-emerged clean and without any new holes in my clothes. And so, needing to get my mind off of whatever was happening in the house that day, I crossed the backyard and entered into the woods. It was a noisy kind of quiet to be found in there, with the sound of birds and bugs and soft dirt underfoot drowning out the nearby traffic. I must have spent two hours stomping around in those woods, breaking branches, poking salamanders, climbing trees... Though without a watch on, I had no way of knowing. It was a place where time seemed to lose all meaning. If not for my t-shirt and sneakers, I could have been a kid from any time in history. A pilgrim foraging for berries, the son of a Civil War doctor sent to locate an herb for a poultice, a hippie child communing with nature. Anything but what I really was. A sixth grader hiding from his broken family. No matter how much I climbed and prodded and explored those woods, though, there was one area I never entered, not since the first time I found it. It was cold and dark, and I didn't like the feel of it at all, like something old lived there, so I avoided it, denied it even existed. I was my mother's son, after all. Eventually, my father and Addie got home, by then, my mother had come out of her room and finished tidying the kitchen to my father's standards. She hadn't looked like she wanted to talk, so I sat on the couch and read. Addie was quiet, not her usual bubbling fountain of words. My father spoke to my mother quietly, and I tried to listen in, but I couldn't make out a word that they were talking about, only that it was serious. I knew my father would be watching me closely, so I didn't bother trying to ask Addie about the night before. Not until after dinner, when my mother and father were watching television. Addie was playing in her room, close to the door, not on her bed like she usually did. The shades on the window were still pulled all the way down. A 
pile of paper was spread out in front of her on the floor, and she was scribbling on them with crayons. Hey, I whispered, what happened? Addie didn't look up from her drawing, continuing to make big circles with the black crayon. I had a bad dream from watching too much television, she said, sounding rehearsed. I could practically hear my father's voice in her words. Last night you said it wasn't a dream. I got confused. I just had... I, I, I just woke up. She grabbed the red crayon, still not looking at me. I could see she wasn't going to say anything to me under the threat of my father, so I decided to try something. It wasn't right, and I knew it, but I had to get the truth out of her if I was going to protect her. Okay, whatever. I think it's going to rain tonight, I said, pretending to change the subject. Mm-hmm, she agreed, making big swoops on the paper with the red crayon. I moved across the room and toward the window. I know you like listening to the rain when you sleep, I said, pulling on the shades. I'll open this so you can hear it. No, 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 no! Addie shouted, her whole body twisting toward me. She looked as if she was going to claw me away from the window. Instead, she clutched her mouth shut, realizing how loud she'd been. We both waited a moment, full of the usual dread. Sure enough. What's going on in there? Our father called out from the couch. Addie rushed to the doorway to answer him. Uh, sorry, I broke my crayon, she replied. It was scary how good we'd both gotten at hiding things from our father. Anything to avoid his wrath. We both waited a heart-pounding second to see if he believed her story. Be careful. Those things cost money, he said, not moving from the couch. Addie apologized again, and then we both took a breath. I apologized as well to Addie for almost bringing our father down on both our heads. But she didn't want to hear it. She gave me a look I'd never seen on her face before. It was cold and angry, and for the first time I could think of, she looked like my father. I left her room without touching or saying anything else. Before I did, I tried to glance at the stack of drawings she'd been making. She saw me looking and covered them up before I could see. That night I stayed up for hours listening, and my door cracked slightly to hear better. At first it was the sound of my parents talking, mostly about money, but eventually they went off to their bedroom, and our small house went quiet. I forced myself not to fall asleep, so I could run to Addie's room at the first sign of trouble. I would get there first, before my parents did, to see what Addie was so scared of, see it with my own eyes, before they had a chance to shut me out. Sometime before midnight, the rain started. At first, it was just the pittering of raindrops against the window, a lullaby sound I had to fight to stay awake, but soon it turned. The rain grew bitter, and the wind shook the shutters. The old house creaked and groaned under heavy gusts. As angry as the storm sounded, it had a song-like quality that eventually coaxed my eyelids to shut. I was woken not by screaming, but by the wind on my face. It was an odd feeling, like someone had leaned over my bed and whispering to me, their breath as cold as the grave. I gasped and sat up straight in bed. My chest was tight, arms shivering. It was even stranger given it was summer, but then I remembered the storm and how quickly the temperature dropped once the rain started. It still didn't explain why I was feeling it, though. Once my eyes adjusted to the dark, I noticed the door to my room had swung wide open, swaying in the unnatural wind. I stumbled out of bed, the wood floor a shock of cold under bare skin. The wind whistled through the open doorway, and more than anything, I wanted to shut the door, put on warm clothes, get back to bed, pull the covers over my head. A strange fascination drew me forward. It would be impossible to fall back asleep, but something so strange going on, of course. But there was something even more important than that. Addie. Addie in the window that had her so terrified, I couldn't even touch it. I ran down the cold hallway and toward Addie's room, the wind going right through me, visions of her open window dancing in my mind, Rain blasting in through the soaked frame, the violent night sky and the storm itself, one finger extended, 
beckoning me to come closer, begging me to join it in the night. But what I found was so much worse. The wind, trapped at the dead end, whipped through Addie's room, creating a cyclone of tumbling and swirling papers. I had to shield my face or risk paper cuts. Her window was still shut tight, the lock at the bottom clasped, but the shades had been raised to the top. The pane was wet from rain, and it was fogged up as if someone had been breathing against the glass from the outside. Raindrops threw themselves against the window, and flashes of lightning popped and jumped in the distance, lighting up the violent night. But all that, that wasn't even close to the worst part. The worst part was the bed, with Addie not in it. My heart felt like a stone lodged in my trachea. Addie's bed, empty, the sheets thrown aside, was everything I'd been afraid of, everything I tried to avoid with my acting out and my standing between her and my father. Yet in doing so, I dropped my guard against all else, every threat that came from outside rather than in. Something slapped against my leg. I jumped, picturing bony fingers clasped around my ankle, eager to drag me away. I grasped desperately at whatever it was, ready to fight for my life, and came back with a sheet of paper. It was one of Addie's drawings, and it was a face. It had a round, misshapen head with the tiniest of eyes at the center, and beneath them the longest, widest mouth I'd ever seen. The smile was practically carved into the paper in red crayon. The paper flapped violently from the wind, causing the face to seem alive in my hands. I looked around then at the papers flying around me. They were simple, crude even, but every one was the exact same thing. A smiling face. It was a tornado of grotesque faces, all of them grinning and laughing at me. The sight of those sickly, smiling faces brought the last minute or so into terrible focus. I knew then where the wind was coming from and why. Worse, I knew where Addie had gone. I ran then, ran harder than I'd ever run in my life, back up the wind tunnel of a hallway, past my room, through the living room and to the front of the house. The entire way there, I prayed not to find what I thought I would, and yet there was no doubt in my mind. I could see it so clearly, the culmination of a thousand nightmares, and even then, when I saw it, with my own eyes, the actual image of it caused the nightmares to pale and wither under its power. The front door, unlocked from the inside, swung wide open to the wind and rain, and a hatty, little hatty, was gone, long gone. I don't remember running outside, and I don't remember searching for her in the woods, screaming into the thunder. I only know that my parents found me on the ground, in the mud, calling out Addie's name with what was left of my voice. I had a waterlogged ball of paper clenched so tightly in my hand that it took the two of them to pry it from my fist. When they finally did, and they managed to unwrap and uncurl the wet, gummy mess enough to look at it, the face at its center smiled at them, too. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 